Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, students, staff, and distinguished guests. Wilson, I'm the Dean of the Law School, and I might stop whatever it is. <laughs> right, it's okay, it's not me. Um, and I'm your panel chair this evening. So we're looking forward to robust, open discussion across the commentators that have donated their time for this evening. Uh, and I look forward in particular to the discussion about the historic constitutional moment created by the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Can I also ask you all to turn off your mobile phones? Um, so if you, you're a very confident group, no one has reached for their phones, but um, I do encourage you to turn them to silent or off now, just in case you haven't before, but if you have, that's fabulous. I also want to point out that we are filming and recording tonight, so if you have an, ob an objection to being photographed, could you please let the photographer know uh, at the conclusion of the event, and we'll make note of that. Tonight's event comes at an historic time in our nation's struggle for reconciliation and just recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Last year, as I imagine most of you know, in May, the First Nations of Australia formed an historic and unprecedented consensus on how they wished to be constitutionally recognised. They asked for a constitutional voice in their affairs, a request to be heard in laws and policies made about them. They also asked for a Makarata Commission to facilitate agreement making and truth telling about history. In October last year, the government rejected the proposal for a First Nations constitutional voice, but the discussion is ongoing. A joint select parliamentary committee has now been put together to further explore the issue and Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians continue to push for this reform. Tonight is a chance for all of you to hear from Indigenous leaders and constitutional experts in the field and to ask your questions of this group. Each speaker has been asked to prepare brief comments and each speaker will then resume the panel and we will take questions at the end of the presentations. I will, however, introduce each speaker in turn. We have agreed in that way I save you, the audience, from the introductions to five speakers consecutively now. So it is an extraordinary pleasure for me to introduce Thomas Mayor. Thomas is a Zenith Kess man who lives in the Larrakia land in Darwin. He is the elected branch secretary for the Northern Territory branch of the Maritime Union of Australia and the president of the NT Trades and Labor Council. He was a delegate at the Uluru Convention and is an advocate for the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Might we make Thomas welcome? Thank you, Pip, and um, thank you, Uncle Bill, for the welcome. I want to acknowledge your people, Wurundjeri people. Um, this was and always will be your land. Um, and I pay my respects to your elders, past and present. I, um, I was a wolfie from about 17 years old, and, uh, and I was on the wharf for about 16 years. Uh, and I, I got a good understanding of the value of, uh, of collectivism, and, uh, and I learned some good politics, in my view, at the wharf with a lot of colourful characters. I, um, I became an official of the union in 2010. And, uh, and basically what I'm, what I'm going to do here is I'll just share, try and briefly share my journey, um, you know, towards Uluru and, and why I think it's so important. As an official of the union, I, um, with the, the support of uh, the members, I had an opportunity to organise in the community as well. And uh, one of the, uh, you know, we organised a, a big rally uh, in response to the community closures issue in WA. 
um, and also I was a big part of organising the, uh, the response to the disgrace um, that was Don Dale and the way that youth were being treated um, in detention. Um, through that uh, organising, I, uh, I felt that there was something missing in, in the way that uh, we, we uh, take up our issues, you know, that, that there was something more that needed to be done, which was good timing because it wasn't long after um, that I was asked, because of my activism, I was asked to be a part of the Darwin Dialogue into um, constitutional recognition. I, uh, I attended the trial dialogue. I was going to be one of the facilitators um, in the dialogue, which was in this building, actually. There was a trial dialogue with the facilitators and co-chairs from the 13 or 12 regions it was then. It became 13 regions when Canberra was added to it. Um, and, uh, and I learnt about what was to come. Uh, I'd learnt also about the past, you know, of, of the history of uh, this particular debate. I wasn't deeply involved until that point. And, um, and I learnt that there was going to be, you know, these, this series of dialogues around the country. And, uh, and in the trial dialogue, like the dialogues themselves, there was, um, there was ed education on what the Constitution is, um, you know, the, the history of the struggle going, you know, back to colonisation all the way up, including the more recent um, sort of milestones, the, the, um, the uh, expert panel recommendations and all that sort of stuff. Um, there was lessons on the way our parliament works, you know, and all that. And so these dialogues had 100 people um, that were to be organised by the local co-chairs and the facilitators. There was a formula applied of 60% people from you know, the, from the country there, the traditional owners in that region, 20% um, Indigenous people from Indigenous organisations in the region and 20% active um, Indigenous members in, in that region. Uh, I had to pull out of being a facilitator because my Union National Council was going to be on the same date, but that changed and I was able to still attend as a delegate. At the trial dialogue here, I asked the elders in the room, I said, has there ever been an opportunity like this, you know, because in my mind, coming from a union background, I saw this series of informed dialogues as an opportunity, a, a real power building exercise. And the, the response was, no, there hasn't been an opportunity like that. And I think, you know, as far as the, the, the importance of that process, that'll be discussed a bit later. But purely from a, you know, a campaigning perspective, a, a member of the community, I thought this was a great opportunity. And so I went to Uluru with great hope. I was elected in Darwin to go to Uluru. And I went there with great hope that we'd reach some kind of consensus, you know, something that we could, um, that we could fight for, you know, something specific that we could unite around the country and, and, and really achieve something. Because in those dialogues, we learn about, um, you know, other aspirational moments, the, you know, the, the Barunga Statement, um, the Larrakia Petition, the Yolnu Bark Petitions, you know, hanging up on a wall in Parliament sort of thing and, and just gathering dust but not having been implemented. And so that was one of the drivers of, um, of that great hope of Uluru. When we went to Uluru there was high tension. Um, there was, there's been a long discussion in this country about recognition um, and, and recognising us in the Constitution but there had never been the question asked of our people. And so that had caused a lot of, um, you know, and, and very justified mistrust of, uh, of the, the process and what was going on. And so that, was, that, was, that made Uluru, you know, quite high tension and also some of the dialogues. On the second day of the Uluru Convention, which was three days the same as the dialogues, um, there was seven delegates that walked out and a, and a, a whole, um, about 13 um, supporters. They went straight into a media scrum, you know, and, and that was uh, broadcast uh, to the country and to the world. And that was their right, you know, because we're not a homogenous people. Um, you know, we don't always agree. But what was important, in my view, was that around 250 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders remained for the rest of that second day. And they came back in the morning on the last day and heard the Uluru Statement from the Heart read for the first time. And it was a moment that I'll never forget. The entire room 
stood as one and endorsed the statement with standing acclamation. There was not one amendment. It was so perfect. And I'll read the statement out soon. The, um, in that moment, I, I looked around the room and I saw people that had been in passionate debate against each other through the process in the workshops, embracing each other with tears in their eyes. You know, it was such a, a profound moment of hope um, that, you, that is just etched in my mind and makes me so, um, you know, so committed to seeing that this statement is not one that sits on a wall without achieving what it asks for. And that's really, really important. Um, I'll read the statement now. The Uluru Statement from the Heart. We gathered at the 2017 National Constitutional Convention, coming from all points of the southern sky, make this statement from the heart. Our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes were the first sovereign nations of the Australian continent and its adjacent islands, and possessed it under our own laws and customs. This our ancestors did, according to the reckoning of our culture from the creation, according to the common law from time immemorial, and according to science more than 60,000 years ago. This sovereignty is a spiritual notion, the ancestral tie between the land or Mother Nature and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who were born therefrom remain attached there too and must one day return thither to be united with our ancestors. This link is the basis of the ownership of the soil, or better, of sovereignty. It has never been ceded or extinguished and coexists with the sovereignty of the Crown. How could it be otherwise? That peoples possessed the land for 60 millennia and this sacred link disappears from world history in merely the last 200 years? With substantive constitutional change and, constitu and structural reform, we believe this ancient sovereignty can shine through as a fuller expression of Australia's nationhood. Proportionally, we are the most incarcerated people on the planet. We are not an innately criminal people. Our children are aliened from their families at unprecedented rates. This cannot be because we have no love for them and our youth languish in detention in obscene numbers. They should be our hope for the future. These dimensions of our crisis tell plainly the structural nature of our problem. This is the torment of our powerlessness. We seek constitutional reforms to empower our people and take a rightful place in our own country. When we have power over our own destiny, our children will flourish. They will walk in two worlds and their culture will be a gift to their country. We call for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. Makarata is the culmination of our agenda, the coming together after a struggle. It captures our aspirations for a fair and truthful relationship with the people of Australia and a better future for our children based on justice and self-determination. We seek a Makarata Commission to supervise a process of agreement making between governments and First Nations and truth telling about our history. In 1967 we were counted, in 2017 we seek to be heard. We leave base camp and start our trek across this vast country. We invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. That's a statement from the heart. <laughs> the Uluru Statement calls for three things, basically, and that's voice, treaty and truth. The voice that it calls for is a constitutionally enshrined voice, a First Nations voice. Uh, the importance of that is that that structure doesn't exist right now. John Howard scratched out ATSIC many years ago, um, in 2005 I think it was, and there was nothing to replace that. What we have now is Prime Minister appointed um, Indigenous Advisory Council, I think it's called. We have, um, you know, we have media that tap you know, certain Indigenous people on the shoulder and say, you're the spokesperson for your people today, that cannot continue. And that's one of the reasons why I think this is very important. It's about First Nations having their representatives able to come together, able to debate and discuss the policies and the legislation that's up and then be able to affect that. That's why, that's what the, um, in the dialogues, it was recognised that we need that sort of voice you know um it didn't call for the race powers to be amended it didn't call for um a, a non-discriminatory clause in the um in the constitution because they were legal mechanisms you know that would take time you know in the high court and all that 
It recognises that we need to be able to come together as a people. We need authorised representatives that are able to take up our cause and influence the decisions before they are made. The constitutional enshrinement is important because it is a way of protecting this voice from the whims of the parliament of the day. The ideologies change. We need to be able to protect it. We need to be able to put it out of the reach of the likes of John Howard. And therefore, that is why that is so important. It's a more tougher task to achieve, but we can do it, and I think Australia is ready. Um, the Makarata Commission is about truth-telling and it's about agreement-making. It's about supporting treaty-making around the country. It's about, um, from my perspective as a unionist, it's important to have an umpire, you know? Um, it's important to have a place to go at points of dispute. And it's important to protect what you're able to negotiate. Um, after Uluru, this was painted. Um, the woman at Mutajulu uh, painted this. Their names are down the bottom here, and I invite you to come and take photos afterwards of the, the statement. Uh, the main artist was uh, Rene uh, Kulija, and it depicts the dreaming, the song lines coming together. Um, and then what the signatures you see here are the signatures of those that endorsed it, that stood. Um, and endorsed this with standing acclamation. They signed this immediately afterwards, and then the statement was printed in the middle. I first saw this in August at Gama, and uh, I saw how powerful this, this, this document is, not just the words, but the, you know, the artwork, uh, the signatories, some really um, strong and, and uh, you know, long-held leaders here. You know, people like the late Sol Belair signed this. Um, and supported it. And so I started taking this around the country. It's been to Wave Hill, um, to the Gurindji people, it's been to the Pilbara, to Lumberdina and the Kimberleys, it's been to Kigari, Fraser Island, um, towns and cities in between. And everywhere that I went, the support has built for this thing. The support is built to see that this is implemented. But at the same time, the support started to disappear from Malcolm Turnbull. And in October in two, last year, he dismissed the call for a voice um, to parliament, a constitutional voice to parliament. So right now, just to finish, sorry if I've gone over, um, we need a people's movement. Um, as Pip said, there's a joint select committee now. Um, we need a people's movement to see that this is implemented and that Australians support it, and then we can move forward as a Makarata to coming together after a struggle. Thank you. Thomas. Our second speaker is Professor Cheryl Saunders, AO. Laureate Professor Emeritus at Melbourne Law School and convener of the Constitution Transformation Network and a senior technical advisor to the Constitution Building Program of International IDEA. Cheryl was also a deputy chair of the Constitutional Centenary Foundation when it developed its innovative approach to public deliberation on important constitutional issues, which was adapted for the Indigenous dialogues. Cheryl has advised on numerous, numerous processes and substantive changes on constitutional issues around the globe. Let us make Cheryl welcome. Thank you, Pip. Uh, it's almost impossible to follow Thomas, uh, but let me, let me try. Uh, and let me begin also by acknowledging that we stand on the lands of the Wurundjeri people uh, and pay my respects to their elders past and present and thank uh, Uncle Bill for his uh, introduction and his welcome. Uh, well, as you've heard, the Uluru Statement from the Heart was the outcome of a First Nations Constitutional Convention held in Uluru in May last year which in turn drew on the conclusions of 12 or 13, Thomas, uh, regional uh, uh, dialogues held across Australia uh, from the end of 2016. Those events involved more than 1,200 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, representing traditional owners, community organisations and other Indigenous leaders. 
Their task was to consider which, if any, of the proposals for constitutional change previously canvassed by an expert panel and a parliamentary joint select committee amounted to meaningful recognition in the eyes of Indigenous Australians. The challenges for them were enormous. As Thomas has remarked, opinion was deeply divided and scepticism about the whole project of recognition was rife. And these challenges made it all the more remarkable when the Uluru Statement was agreed by consensus with its three key recommendations for voice, treaty and truth-telling in the atmosphere of euphoria and hope that Thomas has just described. The achievements of Uluru are a credit to the vision of everyone involved. In practical terms, they were also made feasible by the design of the dialogues and the convention to which they led. These deliberately built on knowledge, encouraged frank but respectful exchange of views and fostered a sense of trust and common purpose. Each regional dialogue also considered um, what recognition might mean in its own local context so that the Uluru Statement ultimately reflects the experiences of Indigenous peoples around Australia. The details about how this worked, what happened and what each of the dialogues said are available in the final report of the Referendum Council. It's worth reading, not only because of the importance of recognition itself, but because Uluru offers a model for other constitutional processes as well in a country where the constitution is so often contentious uh, and said to be frozen in time. Elsewhere in the world, the Uluru Convention might be described as a constitutional moment, a point in time at which people rise above their day-to-day -day preoccupations with a sense of collective purpose to reach a sufficient consensus so as to make a new beginning possible. These moments are rare and they need to be seized. The extraordinary events leading to the post-apartheid con uh, constitution in South Africa are another example in our time. As that example shows, even a constitutional moment doesn't guarantee smooth sailing from that point on. But it makes the impossible at least conceivable and it provides a foundation on which a better future can be built. The difference in Australia for present purposes is that constitutional recognition involves two parties, unequal in size and political power and with potentially, although not necessarily, divergent perspectives. The Uluru Statement represents critically the collective view of Indigenous Australians about what recognition means. That view wasn't formulated in a vacuum, however. The participants worked with options that had been canvassed by earlier processes, they were fully aware of the constitutional context and they were confident that they had found a way forward that was a good fit. And I think they were right. The fact remains, nevertheless, that the Uluru Statement from the Heart cannot take effect unless the rest of Australia agrees, not only in technical terms, by taking the necessary steps to change the constitution, but in spirit, by embracing the opportunities that Uluru offers effectively extending the constitutional moment. The immediate response of the government was not encouraging and yet another parliamentary committee is now in train. Nevertheless, I prefer to think that we are presently at a crossroads rather than an impasse. Uh, and there are various ways forward and uh, Jill's processes that she'll talk about shortly uh, also uh, underscore that point. Ultimately, it will be up to all of us collectively to decide what path to take. To that end, Australians need to understand what is proposed and what it means in principle and practice. That is the purpose of events like this one. It's wonderful to see so many of you here tonight and we look forward to the discussion that follows. Thank you. Thanks very much, Cheryl. Our third speaker is Professor Adrienne Stone. 
Adrienne holds a chair at Melbourne Law School, where she's also the Kathleen Fitzpatrick Australian Laureate Fellow and a Redmond Barry Distinguished Professor and Director for the Centre for Comparative Constitutional Studies. Adrian researches in the areas of constitutional law and constitutional theory with a particular uh, focus on freedom of expression. Let's welcome Adrian. Thank you very much. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, as a person that both lives and works on Wurundjeri land, it was a real privilege to be welcomed to it by Uncle Bill. Thank you very much for that. I want to address you some remarks about the Uluru Statement because I regard it as presenting all of Australia with an opportunity to make a new political settlement or perhaps a political settlement for the first time with the Indigenous peoples of Australia. It was entirely appropriate that the first stage of that process was led by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And it is very important that they continue to play a central role, including, and I should acknowledge, those voices within the Indigenous communities which may offer a different view. But we are at a point where the debate needs to shift in focus. Appropriate response to constitutional reform requires a vigorous, open-minded and well-informed debate about the Uluru proposal and its place in Australia's constitutional structure. And it is in the spirit of furthering that kind of debate that I speak to you tonight. I should be clear that I regard my role as a constitutional lawyer in this debate to be necessarily limited. Constitutional lawyers have no, by virtue of their expertise in constitutional law, have no special insight into how Australia ought to engage in this political settlement. That question, whether we should seize this opportunity can only be answered by Indigenous peoples in dialogue with the rest of Australia. But an expertise in constitutional law offers the benefit of some experience, technical knowledge and a broader perspective on constitutionalism and that is what I offer. I hope that that perspective can first of all lend some clarity to the proposal. Some of you will know it very well but for others, I might just say a word or two about its principal features. The first is that much of the detail is to follow, quite appropriately, the Uluru Statement itself and the Referendum Council report with accomp which accompany it seek to outline the proposal in broad outline and at the Referendum Council report is explicit that further consultations of all kinds need to take place before the detail is fully fleshed out. However, it is already clear that some aspects of the proposal do not require constitutional reform in the technical sense. Those aspects of it which seek to implement a treaty process and a truth-telling process, it is envisaged, um, would be implemented through a Makarata Commission which would supervise the making of agreements between governance, governments and Indigenous peoples and would facilitate truth-telling about Indigenous history. That can be created by ordinary legislation and it will in fact continue a process that has been happening at state level. The proposal for a First Nations voice, however, is of constitutional significance and would entail the amendment of the Constitution to include a body that would be consulted by Parliament on matters affecting Indigenous peoples. These, these consultations would not be legally binding, the body would have, not, have no veto. The proposal seeks to engage Parliament with Indigenous peoples and their views of their interests without fault fundamentally altering its structure. Now, that's the proposal in its barest outline. And from my perspective as a constitutional lawyer, I would like to note what I think are three of its strengths. Now, for those not following the process very carefully up to the Uluru Statement, the result of the Uluru Dialogue may have seemed very surprising. 
At the beginning of this process, the most commonly suggested proposals, at least among the non-Indigenous constitutional lawyers that I confess I hang out with, included a non-binding acknowledgement of the special status of Indigenous peoples, a prohibition on racial discrimination. But those proposals, which might have been popular amongst constitutional lawyers, were soundly rejected at uh, Uluru. In the light of our constitutional history and culture, however, the result is not as surprising. On the contrary, the Uluru's proposal seems consistent with core aspects of Australia's constitutional history and culture. Australians have a notable preference for substantive reform over pure symbolism. In my view, they also prefer constitutional procedures over explicit statements of value. It's for that reason, for instance, that the Australian Constitution has remained especially resistant to the idea of constitutional rights relying rather on democratic processes. Now, you may think that that is a good feature of the Australian Constitution, or you may not. What I want to point out here is that in proposing a new procedure for consultation and engagement with Indigenous people, the Uluru Statement charts a distinctively Australian course that is neither purely symbolic nor highly explicit about Indigenous aspirations. It is practical, procedural, and provided it is embraced, potentially powerful voice for Indigenous peoples. This procedural reform would also bring the advantage of flexibility. I think it is reasonable to suppose that Indigenous aspirations about their status might change over, the time, over time, as the aspirations of any community would do so. After all, there was a time when the amendment adopted in 1967 seemed, for many of us, to settle the constitutional status of Indigenous peoples in the Commonwealth. Yet, through modern eyes, it is profoundly inadequate. If constitutional recognition in 2018 or after were to take the form of a highly explicit statement of Indigenous aspirations, we might quickly find its sentiments entirely inadequate. The proposed voice to parliament by establishing an ongoing process would allow future generations to pursue their aspirations in their own terms. And the final thing I'd like to say about the Uluru proposal is although procedural and practical, it has considerable symbolic power. Despite the Australian distaste for pure symbolism, the symbolic significance of our constitution cannot be ignored. It is the very reason that so many of us take the idea of constitutional recognition so seriously. The Uluru proposal pursues symbolism through procedures and practical solutions a very Australian approach. Enshrining a voice for Indigenous peoples in the Constitution could therefore serve as a powerful, ongoing reminder that the Australian people embraced an institution giving voice to Indigenous peoples. And in doing so, it offers the potential for a proper recognition of Australia's first people. Thank you, Adrienne. Our fourth speaker is Jill Gallagher-Ao. Jill is a newly appointed Victorian Aboriginal Treaty Advancement Commissioner. She's a proud Gujijmara woman from Western Victoria who has provided leadership in the social determinants of health and the protection of Aboriginal cultural heritage for many years within Victorian Aboriginal community and on a national stage. Thank you, Jill. Thanks for that. Um, before I begin, I also would like to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners, uh, the Wurundjeri people um, and Bill Nicholson. I've seen Bill do a lot of welcome to countries uh, in my lifetime um, and they always inspire me. So Bill, thank you. Uh, I pay my respects to elders past and present uh, and also elders who walk before um, the current generation who, who laid the pathway for, as Bill said, is where we are today. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the process in Victoria around 
uh, the treaty process or treaties. Uh, I want to share a bit about the work of the uh, Aboriginal um, Community As uh, Assembly and the Aboriginal Treaty Working Group. Um, and also probably where the Treaty Commission, uh, where we uh, would like to go and what's been planned and also maybe touch on a little bit about the bill that's currently been introduced into Parliament. Um, um, okay. About two years ago, um, the state government held a statewide forum to talk about what does self-determination mean to us as Aboriginal people. Uh, and at that statewide forum that was held at the Aborigines Advancement League in Northcote, um, the people, the Aboriginal community that um, turned up said, well, true self-determination for us is to look at treaties for us, in, for Aboriginal people, Aboriginal communities in Victoria. Um, but that was nothing new. Um, Aboriginal people in Victoria from across the state have for many years called for treaties. Um, but what was different about this time was that state government said, well, let's talk. So that was quite exciting. So for the past two years, a working group was established. Uh, at, the, at the very beginning, it was called the Victorian uh, Aboriginal Interim Treaty Working Group. Um, and it consisted of, I think from memory, I'm going on memory here, uh, about 15 Aboriginal people from across the state to work out, well, okay, now that the government's interested, where do we go from here? Um, how is it going to happen? How is it going to unfold? Um, and it's a complex process to talk about state-based treaties. So for the past two years, the, the, working, the Aboriginal Working Group um, held uh, conversations throughout Victoria via uh, regional um, dialogue, regional forums. I won't use the Uluru language dialogues. Regional conversations. We had statewide forums. There was online um, uh, feedback uh, and so on and so on. As a result of that, um, the working group took the recommendations from what came out of those conversations um, and developed a way forward as to how we're going to deal with treaties in Victoria. Um, so what we needed to come up with is a mechanism for government to actually start talking to. So who's going who's gonna to talk to the Victorian government around treaties. What's it going to look like? How's it going to... Is it going to be one treaty? Is it going to be multiple treaties? They're all questions that need to be answered. Um, and also the other issue that um, the working group looked at was... Because we weren't an ent a legal entity, the working group, we needed... We needed state government to resource the conversations we were having. We needed state government to resource the research that needed to happen. We needed state government to provide those resources. But what we needed to also do was be semi-independent of government, so it couldn't be a government-driven process. And so what the working group came up with through a lot of uh, conversations, a lot of research, um, was the Treaty Advancement Commission. Um, and that was... Um, uh, through that was the uh, Treaty Advancement Commissioner. That was announced uh, late last year, um, that role, and I have now been in that position since February this year as the Victorian Aboriginal Treaty Advancement Commissioner. My role and my team's role is not to negotiate treaty or treaties. That's not what I'm here to do. My role is to provide the state government with a representative voice or a representative body um, fully elected uh, from the Victorian Aboriginal uh, communities. Um, and everyone might think, well, that's quite easy, um, but it's not. <laughs> um, it, it's, and I have to do it by June 2019. <laughs> uh, but anyways, um, so the working group with the Commission now 
Um, we're unpacking all the recommendations that came out of the report. We had a community assembly that was established towards the end of uh, last year um, because we already had some thoughts about what this representative body uh, could look like, what legal structure it needed to be to give it full independence from government. We, t we spoke about whether it should be a statutory authority, whether it should be a cooperative, whether it should be a whole range of legal entities. And um, that gave an independent voice where government had no control uh, under the statutory authority uh, um, process that we were exploring. Um, under that process, government still had to pick who was going to be on that statutory authority. It was a final sign off by government. So towards the end, what we came up with is a whole swag of recommendations. And so it's my role now as the Treaty Advancement Commissioner is to implement those recommendations. So how do we go from there? At the moment, apart from handing a fully elected representative body by June 2019, my other role is to also maintain the treaty momentum. So to continue the conversation with Aboriginal people in Victoria, that's my priority, but also to make sure that it doesn't fall off the government agenda. Now that might be easier said than done. We do have an election coming up this year, so that's a bit scary out there. Um, but also, uh, you know, we've never had treaties, even though Bill spoke about Wurundjeri being the first um, mob in Australia to actually negotiate a treaty. Um, so true, we've never had that option and now it's on the table, so we've actually got to get it right. So the representative body, their role will be to actually develop a treaty or treaties negotiating framework. So just let that sink in for a little bit. So what the representative bodies and what the representative body uh, will do is actually develop a framework that state government can negotiate with the Aboriginal communities. Now they could be a whole range. It could be one treaty, it could be multiple treaties, it could be both. What's in those treaties? I don't know. That's not my role to find out what's in those treaties uh, or what could be in those treaties. But what I do know is that traditional owners will be negotiating treaties. The representative body, only traditional owners from this state can, um, can run or nominate to be run to become a part of this representative body. It'll only be traditional owners who can actually run to be part of the representative body. So it will be traditional owners who actually decide what a treaty negotiating framework will look like or could look like. We're looking at um, also looking at other models from other countries such as Canada, um, the US, New Zealand, um, and Bill's comment in his opening remarks uh, is so true. It's got to have real benefit, real outcomes for us as Aboriginal people. It is a state-based treaty. It's not a uh, treaty with the Commonwealth Government. So whatever's going to be in those treaties has to be within the remit of what state governments can do. Um, and it has to be not just symbolic, symbolism. It has to be real outcomes on the ground. Uh, and that's something that the working group, there's some of the issues the working group and the, uh, tr the commission are working towards to establish this representative body. There's 50,000 Aboriginal people that currently live in Victoria. And one of my jobs is to work out how can I speak to 50,000 blackfellas? How can I physically do that? Um, so at the moment, the, my office is working on developing treaty, what we're calling treaty road trips. 
Um, in those road trips, we want to talk to Aboriginal people. We want to talk to traditional owners. We want to talk to Aboriginal organisations. We want to talk to local governments. We want to talk to non-Aboriginal people. So non-Aboriginal people understand what we're trying to achieve and, and don't fear a treaty process. A treaty process is not about taking someone's backyard. Uh, it's about, as the Uluru Statement tried to achieve, it's about um, agreement making, treaties. It's about land. It's about culture. It's about recognition. And it's about telling the truth. That's what treaties should be covering. Um, and... The process, even though it's going very quick and it's very, you know, we've got to do it now, we've got to do it now, we've got to do it now, but in the end, the process, I believe, could have real benefits for us as Aboriginal people on the ground in Victoria. And I'm quite excited that um, the Victorian State Government has put treaties on the agenda here for us to explore what that would look like uh, and also getting a representative body that is fully elected from traditional owners in the state of Victoria uh, to help government work out what a treaty negotiating framework would be. It's incredibly exciting, I believe. I think Victoria, again, can show the way nationally. Um, the Commonwealth Government's a little bit um, touchy or maybe a little bit scared, I don't know what it is, um, but we can at least show them it's not a scary process. Um, and there are challenges, of course, it's a cha anything that's worth fighting for, it's not easy. Um, and, you know, we have to hang in there, we have to continue. Um, the advocacy and the need and the recognition for Aboriginal Victorians. So I think it's incredibly exciting um, and I'm confident that Victoria will have treaties with its first people uh, and we will be the first. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jill. Our fifth speaker is Professor Kirsty Gover, who is the chair of the Law School's Reconciliation and Recognition Committee and whose life's research and publications address the law, policy and political theory of Indigenous rights, institutions and jurisdiction, both in Australia and comparatively. Kirsty. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations as the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on today and pay my respects to their elders past and present. So I've been asked to speak a little bit about uh, how comparative experiences drawn from other countries might be relevant to the issues raised by the Uluru uh, Statement from the Heart. And in matters involving state indigenous relationships, the experiences of Canada and New Zealand are of obvious importance to our thinking here in Australia. The first point I'd like to make is that the two elements of the Uluru Statement, the proposed indigenous voice in parliament and the Makarata Commission to facilitate agreement making and truth telling are quite modest proposals relative to the augmentations that have been successful in Canada and New Zealand. Uh, and secondly, that they're entirely in keeping with the emphasis in those countries on consultation and negotiation as the critically important structural uh, features of a good, robust state Indigenous relationship. Uh, so these proposals are pointing in the same directions as things that have been done in those other two countries, and that's because the challenges are essentially the same. In all three countries, Indigenous people are vastly outnumbered by settlers. In Australia, Indigenous people make up just 3% of the national population. In Canada, it's not much more, 4%. In New Zealand, it's a bit higher, 15%. 
but Indigenous peoples in all of those countries face the same fundamental challenge, which is how to be properly heard in the democratic functioning of the state in circumstances where they're continually at risk of being drowned out by a settler majority, even in matters that impact uniquely and directly on their interests. So Canadian and New Zealand law has evolved to contain what are essentially counter-majoritarian mechanisms that support the distinctive historical relationship between settler governments and Indigenous peoples. And these are explicit recognition that that relationship is qualitatively different to the relationship that settler governments have with other citizens. So I just want to briefly mention New Zealand's Treaty of Waitangi, Canada's Constitutional Section 35, and the body of judge-made law on consultation obligations that has developed in both of those countries. And the point I want to make here is that, like the Uluru proposals, the import of the Treaty of Waitangi and of Section 35 uh, in practice and in the day-to-day -day of public governance lies largely in the way that these mechanisms guide the way that Indigenous peoples and states relate to one another. They guide the parties in their dealings with one another irrespective of the particular outcomes, the outcomes of those engagements from time to time. So it's a long-term project. So as many of you will know, the Treaty of Waitangi was signed in 1840 by representatives of the British Crown and by approximately 500 tribal chiefs, or rangatira. Uh, after many years of being denigrated and ignored, the treaty is now recognised as a foundational document and it plays a central role in uh, public governance. But I think what probably is less well understood is that it is the principles of the treaty that are given effect in New Zealand law and not its text, not the three short paragraphs that make up that historic text. Those principles have been developed by the court and by the Waitangi Tribunal and they include the following. The principle that the treaty relationship is a partnership in which the parties are obliged to behave honourably, reasonably and in good faith in their dealings with one another. They are obligated to not unreasonably withhold cooperation and to make all reasonable efforts to repair past breaches of those treaty principles. Ministers must refer Parliament to the impact of new bills on those principles when they're introducing bills to Parliament. Now, most importantly, amongst those principles, in my view, in order to honourably discharge its treaty responsibilities, the Crown must make informed decisions when it is making decisions on matters that implicate the treaty partnership. And ordinarily, this will require it to consult with Māori on those decisions. And I think it's important to note that this obligation is not framed as a right to be consulted. It is a duty on the part of the Crown. It is the Crown's responsibility to make good on this obligation and to ensure that it's done everything necessary to make a fair and just decision and that it has not unreasonably refused to accommodate Maori interests and perspectives. So this, if you like, is the external diplomatic branch of the relationship between the New Zealand Crown and the tribes, essentially. But these obligations and that relationship is bolstered by the presence of Māori in the National Parliament. And I think this is important given the proposal in the statement. So New Zealand has had, since 1867, reserved parliamentary seats for Māori. And these members are elected by the approximately 55% of Māori voters who choose to be on the Māori electoral roll. Every five years, they're given the option to choose the role, and every year, more than half choose to vote for the seven Māori electorates. Um, there were four in the beginning, and the seven represents the increasing numbers of people who prefer to vote in the Māori electorates. Now, as a result of these Māori seats and their long history, the New Zealand Parliament and New Zealand public are now accustomed to hearing Māori perspectives expressed in Parliament and in public debate, and there is an understanding, I think, that this diversity of perspective improves parliamentary decision-making and deliberation. And this, of course, is also the ethos that underpinned New Zealand's 1993 shift to MMP, to mixed member proportionality in our parliamentary system. Uh, and the seats have also catalyzed greater Maori participation in public affairs. There are now 29 Maori MPs in our parliament. 
that's uh, 29 out of 120, so about 24 per cent, which is not at all bad for a 15 per cent minority. And it shows that plenty of people on the general role are also choosing Maori representatives to represent their interests in Parliament. So taken together, the consultation requirement, the external part, and the Maori seats, the internal part, they seem to me to be very similar to the participation and the negotiation proposals in the Uluru Statement. Likewise, very quickly in Canada, since 1982, there is provision of the constitution that protects indigenous treaties and it protects indigenous native title rights. And this is section 35. Importantly, section 35 has formed the basis for the elaboration of a constitutional principle called the honor of the crown, which again requires both the federal and the provincial governments to consult with indigenous peoples when making decisions that impact on their interests and to accommodate their interests, unless it is unreasonable to do so. In Australia, there is as yet no comparable obligation to consult indigenous peoples with respect to decisions made by public governments that impact directly on indigenous interests. And this is a serious deficit <coughs> relative to uh, the other states, to our peer countries. Uh, the Uluru proposals can help to correct that deficit. There's a few points I'd like to make in closing about these comparative examples and their relation to Australia and to the Uluru Statement. And the first is that these consultative obligations seem to me uh, to be rules of engagement. They set out how we have agreed to relate to one another going on into the future. Most issues in such an important relationship can't be predicted at the beginning of that relationship, and we must agree instead to, uh, to deal with them in good faith as they arise. And this is what a lot of these arrangements look like in Canada and New Zealand. And of course, as others have said, given the huge variegation of indigenous peoples, uh, the different, different choices they make about where and how to live, their aspirations can and should change over time, and the relationship needs to accommodate that. If the process is sound, the parties can take something like a leap of faith on matters of substance. That's what I think, and that's what I see reflected in this statement. Secondly, it is the responsibility of governments in Canada and New Zealand to make informed decisions, and part of that is to support Indigenous institutions, to provide space and resources for Indigenous peoples to develop their own representative structures and mandate protocols. And this takes a lot of time. Uh, in Canada and New Zealand, the so-called representation and mandate issues are an integral branch of administrative law, uh, both governments and Indigenous peoples are invested in making these things work, and they are multi-generational in their scope. They necessarily, at any given time, a work in process, and I think that works to the benefit of those relationships. But consultation and agreement making, as the Uluru Statement suggests, uh, together support Indigenous institution making, and the two tasks, I think, can and should be pursued in tandem. Finally, governments, as we all know, may act with the best will in the world, but I think if they make decisions directly affecting Indigenous peoples without regard to the considerable expertise and thousands of years of experience in governance of Indigenous peoples themselves, their decisions will not only be inadequately informed, but the process itself works to undercut the dignity of Indigenous peoples and their leaders, as well as their efforts to be self-sufficient. So I think, in conclusion, setting up these mechanisms would be just the beginning of a very long trek together, borrowing from the language of the statement, but it seems to me there is no reason not to embark on that trek, given the successes of similar measures in countries that we have a close relationship with socially and culturally. Thank you.